All right, so today we are continuing the MPI discussion. I'm going to be going into some more examples, and this already assumes that you have MPI installed. So if you don't, I highly recommend you watch my previous video. I'll post it up right now. But besides that, we're going to go into a little bit of documentation, and then I'm just going to go into some examples, and that will be pretty much the entire length of this video. If you do appreciate these topics I'm going into, and you like the work that I'm doing, please give this video a like and subscribe. They are good metrics for me to see what you guys prefer. And I've noticed that like a lot of my Fortran videos actually do get a lot more traffic. So I've been making more Fortran videos. That doesn't mean I'm not going to make Julia videos, but it they are good metrics for me to see what you guys prefer. So now let's go into some documentation. Okay, so these links will be provided again in the description below. These are the same links that I provided in the previous video, but we're gonna go more into these other functions that I didn't get to cover. That will be MPI send and MPI receive. Now, both of these functions do take some arguments and for the most part, they are just a ton of integers. Now, this first argument is a message item. This is what you send to the process that you're interested in. And this is some kind of flag to show what operation this process is doing. This is the number of elements. As you can see, it says here, if you're just sending a scalar, it's one. But if you're sending an array, this says what size it is. This is the data type, which because we're working with MPI, you have to use these MPI ends, MPI doubles. And you, you'll see that as you as we go through the code. Rank is that ID process name. So if you remember, we call it MPI com rank. That is the rank that we're sending this to. A message tag is a way of adding another flag with your flag. So it's just adding a little bit more complexity. For the most part, it doesn't really matter. But if your, if your code is pretty complex, then you would add a tag here. And then com world and I error is from the initialization. Same idea with MPI receive. In this case, you're receiving the message. So you're just putting that information, what correlates to it, where it's coming coming from and then any tags or communications. Now I'm going through the example this is similar to the Colorado web page that we just looked at, but I added a little bit of differences just so we can see some more going on. Now first we're initializing the MPI process. So we're doing MPI init, com size, com rank. Now in here, this is just a simple example of how you send and receive a message. So let's look at this. We have process rank equals zero. So if we are in the zero ID rank, it is going to set message to 42 and it's gonna send that message to rank one. And then we're gonna do a little print statement and it's gonna show that it sent this message by process rank. And then that should show that this is process rank zero. Now else if over here, this is the one that's receiving the message, it's gonna receive a message of this and it's gonna receive it from process rank zero. Now, if you remember, we have message set to zero here, but because of this call going on here, it should be changed to 42. That is what it's gonna output. And then we have this else statement. So let's say we're running multiple processes and this is just gonna output the message all for all the other processes, which it should be zero because it didn't receive anything. Okay, like before, I'm gonna do an MPI run. I'm gonna just first set two processes and then run it. All right, and we can see that the zero process sent message 42, process one received message 42. Now, if we set more processes, so let's say we have four, and you can see it's a little out of order this time, but it sent this message 42, process two and three kept it at zero, and pro process one got message 42. So that, that is the way that you send messages across. And while I'm sending just this one number, you would use it as a flag to signal, okay, this process can do this operation, this process can do that operation. Okay, now the next two examples I'm going into is from this web page, which is also linked in the description down below. But we are going to go into how they sum up a vector and then also this other process of integration. Now, for the most part, I am just copying and pasting their code and we're just going to go through it line by line. So if you just want to look at their documentation, their comments, you can do that. But I'm going to be going through it. I did notice a couple bugs when I was copying and pasting it. I addressed it in some cases, it is a little wonky, but it still gets the idea across of how send and receive can work in a more complex example. Now the first example here, we are going through some vec, and this is just gonna sum up an entire vector. Now we have a ton of variables up here. We're gonna go through it down here and start out with what is going on. Root process is just gonna be one of the IDs from the MPI process. And the way that this is being broken up is we have a couple if statements and they're all gonna do different things based on what process you're in. Now if you're the root process, you're the one that collects information and it's gonna send it out to the other processes. 
sheets. So in here, it gets an idea of how many numbers we're gonna sum up. So this is gonna get an input from the user. It has a comparison to the max number of rows, which if we look at max rows here, this is the max that we want. Now next, it's gonna start breaking up how many rows goes to each process, which it gets from the MPI con size. So it's just allocating rows to each process, which if you notice is not entirely correct because we if we have like an odd number this division may be a little bit off but whatever this is just to show how we can break things up and then we're going to create this vector as you can see it just starts from one and then the, that cell is filled with one position two is filled with two three three, three so on and so forth so just gonna make this massive vector of just numbers to sum up okay now in this part this root process is now is going to divvy up the work for all the other processes so NID is going from one to number processes minus one, and you're doing minus one because that minus one is the root process that's already doing this stuff. And you're gonna get an idea of how many rows is being allocated to each process. And the way that's done here is we're just taking a space within that vector. So let's say we had 100 cells. Well, if we had 100 cells divided by the number of processes, and let's say we had four, that'd be 25 rows per process. So that very first process, besides root process, would be the start row from 25 to 50. And then you do the same thing for all the other processes. So then it would be 51 to 75 and then 76 to 100. Now, the other part of this is we have to send that information to the other processes, which is what these MPI sends sends are for. For one thing, we have to send what rows it's going to work with. So that's the number of rows to send that's being sent through this process and it's going to send it to the other ones. And that is based off of and ID and also has to send that vector and the number of rows to send to that process. So it's just taking chunks of that vector and sending it out. All right, so in the root process, now it's going to start up doing a sum. So it's going to do zero. So from one to average rows per process. So because it's just starting from the beginning, it's going to once again go on back to the 100 example. It's going to go one to 25. It's going to sum up those first 25 elements going to print that sum and then it's going to start moving on to the other this other do loop so now it's receiving a partial sum and it's receiving from the other ids and it's going to show what that partial sum is coming from in this case the sender and then it's going to add some to partial sum and then we're going to print out that grand total sum okay so this is this is where the the parallelism kind of works in and where it gets a little wonky because if you think about it we we didn't do a partial sum right there's uh it's kind of out of place if you were to think about this in a serial format partial sum hasn't been mentioned at all but it's in this line already it's because you have to think about how the root process is just one of these going down the code and it's just working this one if statement all the other processes they also start it up at the very beginning right so they started up up here they initialized they got the com size com rank but they all weren't the root process so rather than them going to the if statement they went into the else statement so while root process is over here waiting for partial sum or one two and three they got the number of rows to receive from the root process they got the vector that they're working with and they're going to start adding up and doing that partial sum for the vector and then they send partial sum to the root process through this final send here, which now going back, this is now our receive of the partial sum, which this root process gets right here. And then it does a grand total and then it's done. So you can see how making your code multi-processed, you kind of have to think about stuff a little bit differently, especially when you're sending and receiving messages and how certain processes may need to wait for a message, may need to stay paused. Okay, so once again, if I'm running for four, please enter a number of numbers to sum up. I do 100. Now I haven't fully checked if this is correct or not, but this is more showing how you would send and receive messages, which you can see how this, this example works. There's a lot of sending and receiving of these number of rows, the row vector, and then you have to send it to the other processes and the root process has to wait. And all, all this stuff I felt was a good way to show how these messages work with each other. Now, if I do the same process, but now I just do it for one, you can see it did, the, it got the 550 total again, but now we just did the one process rather than four. The math may get a little wonky because of just how easily 100 can get divvied up, but four, 25, these are simple numbers to process. 
which are other things you have to consider. If you're working with a massive multi-core system that's like 64 cores. You have to make sure you're divvying up the work correctly or you're going to have some overlaps and then that's going to be other bugs. Okay, and that's what I have for you this week. If you like what I've been doing, please give this video a like and subscribe. If you have any requests for what to cover in the future, comment in the section below of the video, tweet at me at Twitter at DJ's Office Hours, or email me at DJ's Office Hours at gmail.com. Hope you learned something new, and I'll see you guys next week.